we ready? Amen. It's good to be in the house of God on a beautiful Sunday morning, the eve of the 4th of July, so that makes this the 3rd of July, and I'm feeling patriotic. I don't know what happened to our American spirit. I probably, it probably went away with the Christian spirit, but I, I think we, I still love America. I still love my country just like I still love my God. And I don't know what happened to the American spirit. I, I think it's dying out, but it's not dying out in my heart. It's not dying out in my uh, mind because I, I know that the sacrifice. I know what it took for us to have what we have right now. And a lot of people really don't understand the sacrifice. They don't understand what it means. And, and because of the sacrifice, we are able to worship God in spirit and in truth. We are able, by the liberties, the sacrifice of men gone before us. And we can't just let that go. So I do, I say, God bless America. I thank him. I, you know, I thank him. This is the land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her. That's what we need. And, and, and if the world would only wake up and realize we really do need God to bless our land. We really need God to come and be a blessing over us. And if you feel like I do, let's stand this morning and invite God into this service. Lift our hands toward heaven and call out to him, Father, have your way this morning, oh God.
week in your house, another opportunity, God, to draw closer to you. Father, have your way, Lord God, this morning. Have your way in our souls, God, as you minister to our needs. Lord, you know what each of us have need of, God. You know us by name, God. We're not a guest in your house. Lord, this is where we belong. We belong right here in your presence. Have your way this morning, oh God. Oh, at the cross, Lord. Yes, Father. wants you to think it is all about a dance it's all about singing and making pretend that you're happy but sometimes you just got to be still in the presence of God and allow him to wash away the weak wash away what's been going on in your heart and your mind come on the devil is trying to tell you there is no hope but I'm telling you you're in the right place now you're in that place where the Spirit of God is able to meet with you. He can take you up a little bit higher. He can draw you a little bit closer. He can wash you, cleanse your mind, give you peace in the midst of the storm. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. But God does, and he's here to tell you, I've got you. I've got you. Just hold on. Hold on to my unchanging hand, and I'll see you through this just like I've seen you through everything else. My faith in God has not changed, and it won't change because my God, he won't change. He loves you this morning. Won't you just reach out and touch him? Come on. Don't give up on him. He's here this morning. He wants to minister to your needs if you'd only allow him to. Somebody needs to hear him say, I love you. He loves you, you know that, right? You're special in his heart right now. He's a special place for you if you would only cut out a special time and meet with him. He has a special relationship available just for you, but you've got to want it. You've got to desire it. You've got to say, Lord, I want more of you. Come by here, oh Lord, minister to my need. Come by here, oh Lord, I need a touch. Father, that's what we came to church for. Come on, give him a little bit more, a little bit more. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Come on, somebody else say praise the Lord. <laughs> He's worthy. Hallelujah. <laughs> give the Lord a clap offering. Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's good to be in the house of God on a beautiful Sunday morning. It's good to be back, on, and I'm grateful for what God is doing. Amen. Uh-oh, we got guests. You're only a guest the first time. 
And we're going to get to know your name, so hold on, hold on. <laughs> but welcome to the friendliest church in Albuquerque. That's right. Say, so how can you say that? Just ask any of us. We'll tell you. We're the friendliest church. And that's why, where our endeavor is. We want to reach out to a lost and dying world to let them know that there is a God who's able to do miraculous things. He's able to change the way that you, you think, the way that you live, the way that you perceive things. God is more than able. And you say, well, I haven't experienced that. Welcome to this opportunity to experience him. He's real this morning. He loves you, and he desires to have a relationship, not just a casual, rela an intimate relationship. See, God already knows everything about us. Come on now. There's no secrets we can hide from him. But the reality is, a lot of us don't really know him. We've read some things about him. We've heard some. We've even sang some songs about him. But we don't really know him. But when we come to know him, we know we can trust him. We know we can rely upon him. We know we can call upon him. And he hears us, no matter where we are. That's amazing when you think about that. A God who is always there, 24 he never sleeps, he never slumbers. Now, he's not our servant. We can't boss him around. But I'm telling you, when you know him, you don't want to be without him. Get to know him. That's the God that we serve. Because we're the friendliest church, like I said. and we're, We have our services. We have our Sunday morning service. You're here. You made it right on time. We have a Sunday evening service, a completely different service from our Sunday morning service. We encourage you to come back. You say, what do you come back for on Sunday night? More strength, more power, a greater understanding of who God is. And then we have our midweek service. Wait a minute, you guys go to church too much. Do you eat too much? I don't even want to talk about it. Stop looking at my stomach when I say stuff like that. No, we come because we need more of God. Come on now. That midweek revival give, gives you that stirring in your soul, reminds you that he's still on the throne. And then we have a Bible study Saturday evening. We keep a full schedule so that everybody has an opportunity to come. You say, well, I work on Sundays. Come to a midweek service. Come and let God minister to your needs. That's the God that we serve, and he will change, absolutely change your life. Come on, ushers, help us receive. You ain't never seen an usher like our head usher. Come on, Michael. Show him how to usher. <laughs> Michael drove all night. Okay, he rode all night with his mom <laughs> from Denver. But he wanted to be in service this morning. Praise God. Daddy, would you pray for him? say it every time. We mean it each and every time. Thank you for your giving. Because you give, the house of God is open. Because you give, the word of God is preached. Because you give, men and women come out of darkness. I'm grateful to be able to be a part of what God is doing here in the house of God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. Sister Jamie and I are going to sing a, sing a special but it's not just the performance. If you know the words, you can sing along too. You might feel the same way that we do. God bless you.
Come on, you can sing, my God. to know such an awesome God, one who loves us, Lord, even when we fail, one who loves us, oh God, even when there's doubts, when there's questions in our hearts. God, you remain faithful. Lord, we're so grateful to know you. Continue to lead us and guide us, Father. Continue to demonstrate your awesome power, your grace, your mercy, your love in our lives. And Father, we'll be careful. Yes, Lord, we'll be sure to give you the praise, to give you the glory and the honor. In that mighty name of Jesus, somebody praise his holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a clap offering. He's worthy. You know what, Jamie? What? I forgot. Sister Tensio's not here. That's all right. We're going to have kids with us this morning. I know what you're saying. Sister said, what? I brought him here expecting Sunday school. I forgot all about Sister Tensio and my wife did this road trip. They went to go get my grandkids. Woo-hoo! That's right. We don't have enough kids in church. We went to Baltimore and got some more. Amen. So uh, 
We're going to have kids with us this morning, but y'all can handle it, right? We usually uh, see them make their mad dash to run back there to have fun, but they're going to have fun with us this morning. This morning, the word God gave me comes out of the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure, God will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken them captive by him at his will. You know, it's a sad state that the people of the world are in right now. Taken captive by the devil at his will. For a text, I'm going to use two verses. I'm going to use 2 Timothy 2 and 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And then I went to Proverbs 11, verse 30. He says, And he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. This morning, with the help of the Lord, I want to preach on a message entitled, Reaching People for Christ. Reaching People for Christ. Brother Manny, would you stand and pray for the message and the messenger this morning, please. Reaching people for Christ. We know from our Bible reading that um, Timothy was a teacher. He had been placed in this position by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was writing him this letter to encourage him. We all need letters of encouragement. But I'm here to tell you the word of God is our letter. Our personal letters of encouragement. God wants us to know there is a better way. So we got to do things God's way. Timothy was to help those who were confused about the truth. Paul's advice to Timothy was to, uh, uh, to teach God's truth. And in order to do that, we have to be kind and gentle. We have to be patient and courteous, explaining the truth. See, God's teachers, we we have to promote this uh, uh, understanding nature. We can't come in with our fist up. You know what I'm talking about? Some people, when you want to talk to them about the Lord, they come in ready to fight. All right, let's go. Let's talk. What do you think about Jesus? Dude, I don't want to fight with you. I love him. Do you love him? Because if you love Jesus, there's nothing to fight about. Come on now. Now, When somebody wants to fight about it, you already know that they're set in something. And pastor used to say their minds are made like concrete. He said, totally mixed up and rock solid. They just mixed up. And what what, what am I going to do but waste my time hitting my head against a rock wall trying to get them to hear? They're not going to hear because all they want to do is argue. All they want to do is get me fired up. You know, some people can get under your skin like that, right? We all have that one person that can get right under, right? That that one person that can get you to just, ah! And you're like, I came in happy, but you. But God says we got to be bigger than that. How many want to be bigger than that? That's my desire this morning. God, teach me to be like you. Help me to be like you. A good teacher, we want to teach people how to get your message across 
without crossing people, without getting involved in the foolishness. Whether we're teaching Sunday school, whether we're leading a Bible study, my, whether we're just sitting on the bus having an open conversation. Because you know, that God always gives us those opportunities. Perhaps you're in Walmart and somebody, you invite somebody to church and you, yes, we do invite people to church. It doesn't matter where we are. I invite everywhere. I told him I was, last night I was getting something at Walmart in the grocery store. And a lady saw me getting all this stuff and she said, what are you doing for the 4th of July? I'm coming over to your house. I said, I only have hot dogs and, and burgers. But I saw that man over there in his car. He had ribs. I told him we was going over his house. And so we all got to laugh and giggle out of that. But then I said, hey, but you know what? Really, we are having something at the church. Here's an invitation. And I said, and I know you probably have something going on Monday. She said, really, we don't. I said, well, praise God. Come on over. We're going to have burgers and, and dogs. And we're going to have a good time. You're invited. And she looked at me kind of crazy, but she looked and she said, yeah, we just might do that. That's what, we, that's what we're supposed to do. We're lifting people up to come to hear the word of God. Well, we probably won't be preaching on the 4th of July, but we're opening the door. Come on now. So they just do that. But sometimes when you invite people, they say, well, what do you preach? How do you baptize? I remember I was a new Christian. I was out. We were out inviting people, inviting people. We call it soul winning. We were inviting people, and I walked up to this door, I knocked on the lady said, praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. This is a Christian. I said, I want to invite you. Said, well, what kind of church is it? How do you baptize? Is it in Jesus' name only? And I was like, I don't know. Pastor, pastor. <laughs> and one of the associate ministers came over and they came and they began to say, you know, we baptize in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And she slammed the door. And I said, I thought that was right. He said, well, some people believe in oneness and some people believe in this and so. I'm glad I just believe in the word of God. I believe in the truth of God. I'm grateful for the gospel message of love that was preached to me that drew me out of darkness. I didn't go there to argue with that woman. I didn't go to get her upset. I don't even know why she was mad and slammed the door. But, you know, some people are ready to quarrel with you. They're ready to get into a fight. But God says we are not, not there for that. We're not there for that. If you do that, you'll find yourself feeling dirty, feeling like, I, I shouldn't have did that. God is not glorified in that. Can I get a witness? So Proverbs says, a wise person. A wise person is a model of a meaningful life, like a tree. It attracts people to its shade. A wise person's sense of purpose attracts others to want to know how they, too, can find meaning. Gaining wisdom yourself can be the first step to leading people, other people, to God. See, the more you know about God the more you can share to others about him. The song we were just singing, he's mighty. Did you know our God is mighty? Come on, he's a provider, he's a protector, he's the lover of our soul. He's so many wonderful things. But the more we learn about him, the more we can tell people about him. God, he meets all of my needs. We, we sang another song, More Than Enough. He's more than enough. God is more than enough. But if you don't know that, you can't share that. I like what Jesus said. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you. Oh, man, he put it up there. I wanted to quiz y'all. <laughs> Fishers of men. He's not going to make you fishermen. Some of you are like, man, I need it. I'm trying to learn how to catch me a good trout. Come on. Jesus, teach me how to fish. He's going to teach you how to win people, win men and women toward Christ. And that's what it's really all about. How many know that's what the church is about? 
we come here to gather together to worship our Lord and Savior, but also that others might hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Timothy, learning from Paul, Paul said in verse 22, flee also youthful, lu youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. Sometimes running away is the best defense. The world says it's cowardly. But sometimes it's better to just walk away from foolishness than to get involved in it. I remember now I worked in a lot of craziness. I worked in prison for a lot of years. So you work in prison, you see people in their worst state. I've met men that don't know the word, I'm sorry. They don't understand that there is forgiveness. And so I would meet people that were in these horrible, horrible, heinous crimes. And I'd say to them, why did you do that? Why did He's, he's, one guy had stabbed this guy in the wreck yard. I said, man, that was horrible. He stabbed him like 18 times. Every which way but loose. But you know these guys are like, I want to say on crass, but they're like roaches. They don't die. He stabbed him 18 times. And that dude was back in the yard playing basketball in about two months. You know, if I got a nick on my finger, I'd still be out. <laughs> oh, I got gangrene, something set in, you know. But this guy, and maybe it might be their workout, whatever, but he got stabbed 18 times. And I said to him, I said, well, why did you do it? He said, well, you know, we had a beef. I said, a what? Yeah, we had a problem. He had did this, this, that, and the other. I said, look, look, look. I said, can't we come to an agreement? Can I say I'm sorry and you accept that? Or he, he said, oh, no, one of us has to die. I said, what? What is wrong with you? Listen, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I won't do that again. I didn't know that was offensive to you. And I'm, he was like, no, no, that's, that's how it is. That's what he was told. I said, man, well, Less than a year later, it was role reversal. The one that he stabbed, stabbed him. 20 some times. Again, he's at shock trauma. I'm looking at him. And he's like, he caught me slipping. I said, don't you think this is crazy? Man, we live by the code. You get ready to die by that stupid code. Both of them survived. I told you they're like roaches. <laughs> well, they're, they're getting stabbed with prison-made knives, but still, it's a stab. I don't want to get scratched with anything. Don't touch me. But this is how the wicked live. They don't understand that it's not worth my soul. It's not worth my life. It's not worth your life. That's why we don't want to get into these bickering things. That's the only way. You know, he said, people don't understand that murder doesn't start. People don't wake up and say, I'm going to kill somebody this morning. It starts with that root of anger. That bitterness in your, in your mind. I'm angry. Man, it drives me crazy to see a kid stomp their foot. I told you, I tried to do that one time. Mom said, go to your room. Come here. You walk back softly there. Man. Yes, mother. No, ain't no yes, mother. Because <laughs> you're stomping saying, I'm mad. I'm angry. But we should never get mad. We should never lose control where we have to lash out. 
This is what he's trying to tell us. Listen, you don't want to get to this place. We don't want to get to this place where we are so wound up, we're so angry that we can't control our... Walk away. Just walk away. I'm not here for that. I'm here to lift up Jesus. Come on, you want to talk about him? Let's, let me tell you about my Jesus. I don't want to argue with you. So running away can be the best thing. He cautions him against contentions. He says to prevent this, uh, hey, hey, stay away from the foolish and unlearned questions. They tend to benefit nothing but bring about strife. And listen, those who advance those, those who, who come with those, they come with an objective. Their objective is to get you off cue, to get you out of your wits. You know somebody you like, uh, Hey, I'm a Christian. I'd like to invite you out. Hey, well, I'm a Muslim. Who do you think Jesus is? I don't think. I know who he is. Who do you think Jesus is? You already know they want to spar with you. I don't want to spar with you. I just came to tell you about Jesus. You already know? Well, you think you know something better? Go on. But I'm not going to argue with you about it because he's good to me. And I don't have to fight. Some people want to fight for their religion. Well, I'm a Christian. That's right. And we can fight about it. <laughs> what church do you go to? <laughs> I want to go where there's love. I want to go where there's grace and mercy. I want to go where there's peace. Because don't you know, he says that this peace, this love is what draws men and women. They don't want to come in and brawl. They don't want to come and fight and wrestle with you over who's God. They should know already. That if you're really a Christian, your life will show them that love that only God can give. Timothy said it, uh, Paul said it another place in Timothy 6. A person like this, he is proud, knowing nothing but doubting doting about questions and strife of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men and corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. He says stay away from people like that. See, there are people in the world that think, you can't tell me anything, preacher. You're broke. But sister said it. I'm not rich in money, but I'm rich in faith. I'm rich in God. And my God is able to supply all of my needs. Yeah, amen. See, what I need, money can't buy. What you truly need, your money can't purchase for you. But you're so bitter with the world. You're so confused. You're so darkened by the ways of the world that you don't even realize. Listen to yourself. I'm telling you about Jesus. Is that the way you were taught? Where is the love? Where is the compassion? I'm preaching about winning people. We want to win people for Christ. We want to lead them to him, not push them away. He said, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken them captive by him at his will. The servant of the Lord. Yes, the preacher is the servant of the Lord. But so are you. Well, he didn't call me to preach. But he did give us all a commandment to go ye and tell. Go ye out into the world and tell everybody. So if you're telling everybody, isn't that preaching? Isn't that sharing God's word? So if you're doing that, he's talking to you too right now. So you think, oh, this is for the preachers. Oh, good. Whew, I thought he was talking to me. No, I'm talking to you. 
God is talking to you. Well, this, this seems like it's too high a standard. No, it's not. He loves you. He's trying to take you up. Who wants to go higher in God? I, I really do. I want to be the best me that God would have me to be. He says, we must not strive. We must not be contentious. We must not be looking to start. Some people say, well, Pastor Hicks, because of your law enforcement background, how do you respond? Pastor Hicks, because you, you know, I know sometimes you carry a weapon. See, I had to leave that probation parole job I had because I was putting cuffs on people I really just wanted to pray with. These were young men, these were young ladies who were just lost, lost in the world. I was getting ready to say the system, but it's more than just the system, it's the world. Because they don't recognize the, the need for them to come out of the darkness that they're in. I was, I was supervising 70-some uh, men and women here in our city of Albuquerque. And a lot of these people had families. They had jobs. They worked just like you and I. But somewhere along the line, they crossed the line. And they got in trouble with the law. And as opposed to being in prison, they were allowed to work and live with their families. But they had to report to a probation officer, which was me. Now, I'm the preacher. I'm the pastor. I'm giving them godly advice. But you're a state employee. You're not allowed to say I'm giving godly advice. But that's what I was giving them. And I felt like I was at odds. Because there were men and women that were really trying to do their best. But they were ill-equipped. Why? Because they were using worldly techniques to do what only God could fix. They were doing things, and they were going to AA, and they were going to NA, and they were going to all these things. And finally, I would ask a lot of them, especially them that I knew had some sort of religion, I'd say, what church do you attend? What is your Christian belief, or what is your faith? One lady said, I'm a Catholic, devout. I said, when was the last time you had a talk with your priest? She said, oh, well, it's been a while. When was the last time you went to Mass? When was the last time you prayed? And she kind of shook and looked back and said, well, why are you asking me that? I said, because your problem is more than just a social problem. It's a spiritual problem. And she's looking at me crazy. She's like, aren't you my PO? I said, yes, I am. But what you're going through, she said, well, my husband has PTSD. He, he's a, a, a veteran, and he, all he does is sit on the couch. He stares at the TV. He doesn't work. And his support, the finances, it's not enough to take care of us. So I have to hit the streets, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. And she had all these complaints to lodge. And it was just pouring out. And I felt like I was in a counseling session. I felt like I was getting ready to say, you need to pray. But I remembered I was in an office setting. I remember that they frown upon that Christian talk. What are you talking in there? But I told her, you need to find your priest. And tell them about what's going on in your life. Because if you don't turn this around, you're not going to make it. You have an obligation. You have to pay. They have to pay for their probation. She said, I'm trying to keep food on the table. I understand. But you got to follow the rules. Because if you don't follow the rules, you're not going to make it through this system. And I'm doing all this when really I just want to teach them to pray. I said, I got to get out of this. God, let me free. Because all I want to do is preach. All I want to do is teach men and women. I don't want to continue to lock them up and, and put them in prison for things that they can't even fix without God's help. Come on. This is why we want to lead people to Christ. 
This is why we want a church house open. We don't want to see people go to prison. We don't want to see kids raised by their grandparents. I see some grandparents in here. You ready to take over? <laughs> Wouldn't you rather your kids just get right and take care of their responsibilities? This is what he's talking about. And the devil, the devil has control of these people. And they don't even realize it. They don't understand. They don't know how to break this hole. They don't know how to break the cycle. But we know. I'm telling you, even the most lost Christian knows that if I get on my knees and pray, can I get a witness? If I get on my knees and pray, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out mercy like I've never seen before. Help is just a prayer away. But the world doesn't know that. So we have to go out and tell them and share with them. That lady came to me about two months later, and her life was turning around. And she said, I want to thank you. Nobody's ever talked to me like that before. I said, I'm a Christian first. I am a probation officer. I will put the cuffs on you because that's my job. But my desire is that you succeed. My desire is that you wake up before it's too late. See, in real life, it's not about going to prison, but it's going to hell. People are dying and going to hell, and they're playing with it like it's just a, I'm just going to spend a little time and time out. I'm only going to go to the, the, to the county jail. It's not like I'm going to the state prison. This is how they play with their lives. I don't want to go to the county. I don't want to go to the timeout spot, okay? <laughs> I don't want to go to jail. And I definitely don't want to see any of you in hell. Come out. Let, listen. Receive what God is trying to give you. Titus said it this way, speak evil of no man and be no brawler, but be Gentle, showing all meekness to all men. How do we really show humility? We show the love of Christ. I'm not just talking about putting on a show. Oh, we have company today, so everybody say amen. Everybody say amen on cue. Everybody, let's, let's put on our, our pretty smiles, our pretty faces. God is good all the time. And that's phony. And the people can see through a phony humility. But when you're genuine, when the truth, it comes out naturally. It boils down to having an honest estimation of yourself. This is me. This is all I am by God's grace. And by his grace, he's allowed me to preach the gospel and to lift up his name and tell you there is hope for the hopeless. There is rest if you'd only make it to God. He said to help them that they might recover themselves, that they might wake up, stir them up, say, look, come on, snap out of this. You're getting ready to go to prison. You're getting ready to leave your family. You're getting ready to leave everything that you've been working for. You're getting ready to die and go to hell, and you don't know Jesus. Well, I know him, but you don't know him as your savior. You know how I know? Because you don't have peace. You don't have that blessed assurance. You can have it today, though. You can leave here knowing that I've been with Jesus. How many want to do that? I, I want to leave knowing that Jesus is with me. Jesus said, or the Lord said unto Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. These are words that Jesus gave to this man 
to let him know we're always going to be under attack. But thank God Jesus is praying for us. Thank God he's praying for us. He says, Simon, he, he wants to, Satan wants to crush you. Not only you, but everybody he can. He wants to crush you like grains of wheat. And he hoped that only he would find chaff that would blow away. That's what he was thinking of. That's what the devil thinks of all of us. He just wants to crush us under his feet and us to blow away. He wants to see us all destroyed. But Jesus prayed for us. And now we can boldly say, no, not this time, devil. No, I'm not going to bow down to you. Why? Because the word of God has been exposed to my heart. And I know the way out of darkness now. Hallelujah. Proverbs 11 and 30, it reads, The fruit of righteousness is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now God is talking to us again. Remember I said, go ye, that's us. He said, now he's letting you know, we who are sharing this message, we're really wise people. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done. God has given you the secret to life. And that secret is, do God's bidding. If you do God's bidding, he'll take care of you. Can I get a witness? He'll meet all of your needs. Say, Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't have enough to pay my rent. Did you pay, take care of God? Because he's going to take care of you. We, just think about it. See, we, we, we worry about things that God is saying, I've already taken care of it. Are you trusting in me? Are you listening to the lies of the devil? I'd rather trust in him. This fruit of righteousness, it produces namely uh, this charity, this, this, this love, this, this spirit of peace, that sweetness, that willingness to teach others what you've learned. God gave us this. God gave us this, and that's why I could sit in that meeting with those people and share with them. I remember this one young man. It was right around the Christmas season. He'd already told me about he had lost his job. And he was worried about how he was going to take care of his son for Christmas. He was worried about how he was going to get him Christmas things. He was worried about how he was going to provide shelter. And then he came in. Under the influence of a drug. And he knew that I was going to require him to take a urinalysis test. He knew that he was going to test positive, which would mean immediately placing the handcuffs on him and taking him away to prison. And that was his plan. I got locked up so I couldn't be home for Christmas with my son. But I didn't do it. I didn't lock him up. I waited until February. In February, I put the cuffs on him. And he was crying. And he looked at me. He said, why didn't you do it in December? Why didn't you lock me up in December? I said, because I knew this time you were going to be gone for a year. And your son wasn't going to see you for Christmas. Why don't you wake up? And realize this is not a game. And that man cried. And I never saw him again. But my prayer is that he learned something. We, this is not a game. This is life. These are our lives. These are our children. These are things that are really taking place in our lives. And we have to recognize I have to make godly decisions, or I'm going to lose something greater than what I'm willing to give. I never saw that young man, but I've had a lot of them come up to me lots of times saying, thank you for just standing on principle. Thank you for showing me the right way. 
God knows. You say, well, were you lacking in your job? No, I, I had to take him in custody, but it was a matter of when. And so I took him after the holidays so he would have time with his family. That's the mercy of God. Come on, God has merciful to us. He's been merciful to all of us. You say, well, do you think you're God? No, but I know his mercy. Hasn't he been merciful to you? Are you ready now to answer the call? Are you ready now to respond after God's been dealing with? Come on, sister. Because God's been dealing with a lot of things. God wants us to wake up and realize we've got to share this message of love. He said, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Paul is harping on his favorite theme, the zeal for Christ and his cause in the church. It's always the most upper part of every message that Paul has to bring. We got to put Jesus first. Therefore, we can never say enough. He can never say enough to Timothy to prompt him to watch over the congregation, watch over the children of God, be sure to give them this message. Be sure to reach out to our neighbors. We all have children. We all have loved ones. We have friends and neighbors who are lost and in the world on their way to hell. When was the last time you just prayed for them? When was the last time you just witnessed to them? When was the last time you just invited them? Come on, come to the house of God with me. You say, Pastor, they never want to come. But Jesus never gave up on you. Don't give up on them. Keep inviting. Keep inviting. Keep encouraging them. Keep living a life before them that shows them the grace and the mercy of God. And God, by his Holy Spirit, will begin to woo them. And they'll begin to say, I want to go with you. Tell me about that place. Tell me about that church you go to. Tell me about that Jesus you serve. Tell me about his mercy. Tell me about his grace. Because my life's upside down. My child just took her life. My son's abandoned his family. The world is falling apart and I'm fearful right now. Come to Jesus. That's the message. Come to Jesus. He's waiting for you with open arms. He loves all of us, young and old. Richie, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to. God knows. And he loves you. And he's saying, come home. Find rest for your soul. Come home. You think about it. He said, the fruit of the righteousness is as a tree of life. And he that went of souls is wise. You think about the story of Joseph. Back when Egypt was in the midst of their famine, Joseph was selling corn as God had told him to prepare. And they called him blessed. You think about Jesus when he came to that town, how he fed the multitudes with five loaves of bread and two small fishes. And they loved it. They longed for it. They all craved for more of it. We want more. And Jesus says, you're following me for the fishes. But I've got more than that. Come on. He gives more than corn. He gives his life. He gives wine and oil and bread and eternal life. We have to come and find Jesus. Precious Jesus. He is the bread of life, the bread of God, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Lord, evermore give us this bread as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. He wants to make you a fisher of men. He wants you 
to reach out. Let your neighbor know how good Jesus is. These altars are open. Come on, let's pray. Let's come up here and find your place at an altar. Call them to Jesus. Let him meet your needs. He's here this morning. He loves everyone. He loves you whether you're failing, whether you're thriving, whether, whether things are going all the way you want them to be. When was the last time you talked with him? When was the last time you just had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Jesus? Lord, I need a touch from you right now. I need you to minister to my heart. I need you, God, to open my eyes to the truth. Help me, Lord. Help me, God. As we all find a place to pray. God bless you.
you're finished praying, consider yourself dismissed. It's good to be in the house of God. It's good to share the word of God, to share the love of God. And it's good, just real good to talk with God, to know that he hears our voice, to know that he loves us, and that he's answering prayers. I feel his presence even right now. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to share your word, grateful for the opportunity to preach, grateful for the opportunity to receive all that you have for us. Let your spirit watch over us, God. Lead us and guide us in the path of righteousness. Make us to be winners of souls, Lord God, fishers of men. Help us, Lord God, to accomplish your will for our lives. We'll be careful and sure to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In that mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you is our prayer. We'll be here tonight at 630. Tomorrow at 1, we're having a cookout. It's open to whosoever. Come. Say, well, I don't have anything. We didn't ask you to bring anything. We asked you to come. I got a burger. I got a hot dog. We're going to have